good singing. You may be seated. This morning we are in Acts chapter 4, and as I went through this chapter, I was just again, uh, just how applicable the Word of God is to today. Uh, it is amazing to me that although our time has changed, um, man has not changed. And uh, what Satan himself is even out to do, he is continually doing. So here in Acts chapter 4 is where we will be, but I want to read to you some things actually from the New York Times that came out on May 10th of 2020. Um, and, and it relates to show you how the things have not changed a whole lot. Things from clear back in Acts chapter 4, we are still experiencing today. This is the headline. Franklin Graham is taking down his New York hospital, but not going quietly. And I just want you to listen to these words that this journalist wrote and uh, recorded. It says, the presence of Samaritan's Purse in one of the country's most liberal cities kindled a culture war in New York's coronavirus response, drawing criticism from elected officials, religious leaders, and LGBT groups unnerved by Mr. Graham's past statements on Islam and gay issues, as well as by a requirement that the organization's employees be Christians who oppose same-sex marriage. Critics have included members of the Episcopal clergy whose objections to the group's position on gay issues and non-Christian faiths helped scrap a proposed field hospital inside the Cathedral of St. John the Divine and the Speaker of the City Council, Corey Johnson. He described Mr. Graham on Twitter as notoriously bigoted and said the group's continued presence here is an affront to our values of inclusion. Much of the criticism of Samaritan's Purse stems from the group's requirement that employees and volunteers sign a statement of faith affirming their belief in Jesus Christ and their view that marriage is exclusively the union of one genetic male and one genetic female. Mr. Graham defended that requirement on Thursday, saying it was important to ensure that our work and our presence is united. Bishop, that means he's a religious guy, Andrew M. L. Deach of the Episcopal Diocese of New York said that attitude, that attitude was a key reason the plan to set up a field hospital inside the Cathedral of St. John's, the Divine, had been shelved last month. He said Mr. Graham espouses an exclusionary, exclusionary view and a very narrow view of what constitutes being a Christian. Let me reread that again. The bishop said that Mr. Graham espouses an exclusionary view. In other words, there's only one way for a person to be saved, and a very narrow view of what constitutes being a Christian. On Friday afternoon, the city's Commission on Human Rights closed an investigation into the hospital after finding no evidence it had discriminated against patients according to its press secretary, Alicia McCauley. The field hospital opened on April 1 and received the vast majority of its patients from Mount Sinai's hard-hit community hospital in Queens. Samaritan's Purse personnel treated 333 patients in New York, 190 at the Tent Hospital, and the rest inside two Mount Sinai hospitals, said Melissa Strickland, a spokeswoman. But some New Yorkers have been skeptical. The organization's slogan, helping in Jesus' name, was on trucks outside the field hospital, and Mr. Graham delivered an Easter sermon on Fox News from the site. 
Can you believe that they had in Jesus' name on the side of their trucks? But that's what they were most concerned about. But the controversy did not affect the daily routine of the field hospital. Workers there said they had been warmly welcomed by New Yorkers who sent food and gathered to cheer for them at 7 p.m. We have been so well loved here, truly, said Joe Pike, 30, a nurse who traveled with her husband, Brendan, from Medford, Oregon, to work in the hospital. The couple said their faith had led them to Samaritan's Purse. We work here with people who all share a common sense of purpose, said Mr. Pike, 28, who is also a nurse. We are all here because Jesus died for us and for our sins, so we came here to lay down a small part of our lives to help others. How could we not? Giving sacrificial love is very important to us. And that's just some clips out of this article that was written on May the 10th of 2020 in the New York Times. But as we look at Acts chapter 4, you will see very quickly how the name of Jesus becomes very offensive and becomes more of the focus than it does of actually taking care of even people. And here in Acts chapter 4, I don't think I'm going to have to explain a whole lot to you because it pretty well writes and speaks for itself. But, you know, when we have a chance to stand up for Christ, and we use his name, how well have we done? How well have we done in this time even to proclaim the name of Jesus Christ into a world that is desperately seeking an answer of hope? Today, I hope that we can bring this out, that God's persevering power is what we need above all things. We need to be having our eyes focused on Christ more so than anything else in our time over the past few months. So let's take a look at Acts chapter 4, and uh, we will begin our reading from it to give you some input as well. We're going to be looking at several aspects of this. The first thing we're going to be looking at is threats on the horizon is the disturbance that was facing the disciples and also really the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the religious leaders. So let's just take a look at the first four verses. Now as they spoke to the people, the priest, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them. Now let me stop a moment and remind you, what just happened? The lame man in chapter 3 was healed. And he was a lame man who had been lame for 40 years, all of his life. And so uh, Peter and John, as they were walking into the temple, they see this man who is begging for alms, and they say, Silver and gold have I none, but that which I have I give unto you in the name of Jesus Christ. Stand up and walk. And Peter reaches out his hand. He grabs the man instantaneously. All the weakness in his ankles and feet were renewed. All the muscles were immediately brand new, and he jumped and leaped and praised God, and for the first time, he walked into the temple because he could. It was the first time he was ever allowed to be in the temple because he was healed of his infirmity. And so here we have this carryover into chapter 4, and we see that these priests, the captains of the temple, the Sadducees, came upon Peter and John. Verse 2, being greatly disturbed. Now, wait a minute. A man was just healed. Tremendous things happened. How could you be disturbed about that? Look at that in verse 2. That they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. Does that not sound familiar to what I just read? from the New York Times. It was okay to have a hospital in the Central Park area, but don't what? Use it in the name of Jesus Christ. Folks, I want you to understand, and I don't think that you are asleep to this, but if we are Christians, we better know that we are Christians because the time of our profession is probably going to be tested more and more. 
And for some of you, you may be saying, boy, am I glad that I'm in my 70s or 80s. And yet we have young people in our church that are going to be raised in a culture and in America that is totally in opposition to Christianity if we continue in the same direction. We are already in a different America than what we were 20, 30, 40 years ago, yes? We really are. And so to name the name of Jesus Christ and do things in the name of Jesus Christ has become offensive. You can be a church as long as you don't get too preachy about Jesus and the resurrection and that it's the only way to salvation. Because that's an exclusive message. Verse 4, however, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of men came to be about 5,000. And some people believe that is an additional 5,000 added to the 3,000 earlier. Some believe that it is an additional 2,000 people that came to know Christ as their Savior that day. It doesn't matter to me whichever number it is. It's a lot of people, isn't it, to see saved. I mean, that's pretty much... Uh, Three quarters of Kenton. Wouldn't you like to see three quarters of Kenton to know Christ as their Savior? Wow, what a different community this would look like. The police officers wouldn't have much policing to do, would they? The, the judges would be like, um, you know what, what, what? Man, we're really bored. We don't even have a backlog of cases. What, what's wrong with this place? My goodness, hospitals, emergency rooms, maybe a little less as well because people's lives were changing. But the disturbance was the very fact of it wasn't about the lame man being healed, but it was that they were teaching and preaching in the name of Jesus Christ and the resurrection of the de from the dead. And of course, the Sadducees, which are mentioned specifically here, they were, as we have this little saying, the Sadducees were so sad, you see, because they didn't believe in the resurrection. And they didn't. They didn't believe in the resurrection from the dead. And so this was very much an offensive thing. They believed that the way to salvation was the law. It was by being a good person. But again, if you don't believe in the resurrection, what do you really believe? Well, let's take a look at the charge, verses 5 through 7. And it came to pass on the next day that the rulers, elders, and scribes, as well as Annas and the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and as many as were the family of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? Talk about a stacked court or jury. If you've ever been on jury duty, you know the process. And you know there might be 40 to 50 people who are invited for a, a morning to be asked questions or to be put on a jury. And of course, on that jury, the, the attorneys are looking for people that are pretty much neutral on the topic. They are going to be pretty much fair in their evaluation. They're going to look at the trial. They're going to look at the person who is on trial and give them every possible opportunity to prove themselves to be innocent. And then they will deliberate, and they will deliberate for some time in order to make certain that they get the verdict right. This was not such a jury. Look at the, I talk about one-sided. These were all Sadducees. They were all of the same ilk, and they were of the same family. Could you imagine those that were disturbed being on your jury? They're accusing you of something, and they're going to be the jurors in your case. Would you like that? No way. So here's Peter and John, and they are up against a pretty bad situation. And the charge, obviously, is whose name do you do these things in? Not, was the man truly healed? Oh, we want to congratulate you men. This is a wonderful thing that has taken place. But whose name do you do this? And you would think, at this moment, Peter would uh, maybe hesitate. 
Think about Peter. Where was he just about two, three months prior? He was in the same situation. He was in the garden, and Jesus was arrested. He then followed Jesus to the court of hearing where the high priest and the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, the ruling party, he was there watching as they took Jesus to Annas and to the others, and there was a girl who pointed her finger at him while he was warming himself by the fire, and she said, aren't you one of his disciples? And Peter said, oh no, I don't even know the man. And he said that three times. Have you and I not been there? When we've had an opportunity to share Christ with people, or we think, you know what, I'm praying for this person, and we think, I'm going to share something about Christ with them today, and we back away instead of press on. I think all of us would say, yeah, I could tell you a time or two or three when I did not share Christ. So Peter has an opportunity, a redo. What will he do? Because this is the first time that the church, which was going great guns, it was going well. People were getting saved, and it was on a roll, and it was the thing to be, it was the thing to do. And for the first time, some threatenings came against the church. And what will we do when we are threatened? when we are confronted about our faith or we are questioned because we are Christians. So what would Peter do? Look at the defense, verses 8 through 12. And I'm telling you, he did not back away. Verse 8, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Do you think Peter hesitated? Doesn't sound like any hesitation at all, does it? You know, we, we skirt the issue. We avoid it. We may not jump into it, but folks, I want to encourage you. We have an opportunity in this time to share Jesus Christ with those people that we come into contact with. We need to give them Jesus. As Franklin Graham, in Jesus' name, on the side of those semi-trucks that brought in the help to New York City. Folks, we have an opportunity because we have in Jesus' name written across us. Because it's in Jesus' name that we have been saved from our sin, that we have been given new life so that we might go into eternity to be with the Lord Jesus Christ forever. Those who do not receive him, we know the message. They will be separated from God for all of eternity, and they will be in hell. There's a world out there that they need to hear more about Jesus than, yes, the events of the day. Because the events of the day have so enamored us and so focused. But I know people are a little tired, aren't you? Aren't you tired of turning on that TV, the radio, whatever it is, and it's the same thing over and over and over again. We've got a different message. We've got a different message. We have something that can speak into the lives of people, great hope and encouragement and new life. And it is an exclusive message. How bold was Peter? <laughs> Why don't you take a look at just a few of these verses. Verse number 11 is where he uses this Old Testament quote. 
It is in Psalm 118, verse 22, and it says, The stone which the builders rejected. Jesus would take that same scripture in Psalm 118, and I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew 21, verse 42. Matthew 21, verse 42. In these verses, Jesus stands up and he begins to teach. In verse 42 of Matthew 21, he says these words. Have you never read the scriptures? And of course, could you imagine, Jesus is standing in front of the Pharisees in Matthew 21, 42. And he says to religious people, have you never read the scriptures? That would be like me standing in a group of, full of pastors and basically saying, haven't you read the scriptures? You would take offense to that, wouldn't you? But they didn't understand. He says, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. And whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. Now, when the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking of them. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitudes because they took him for a prophet. Was he talking about them? <laughs> Absolutely he was. Yes, they perceived right. Now go back to Acts chapter 4. How bold was Peter? Notice how he quotes this scripture. Acts 4, verse 11. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. He did not want them to miss the fact that this scripture was directly related to them. Do you think that would not make them a little upset? Yes, you are rejecting the chief cornerstone. You have rejected Jesus Christ. You have put Jesus to death. And folks, I hate to say it, but that's our message, isn't it? That's the message of salvation. It starts off bad. There's some bad news connected to it, but there can't be good news unless we first share the what? The bad news. The reality of our sin and what it has done and what it requires. It requires the ultimate perfect sacrifice of a holy God. And the holy God who loves us so much that he sent his son and his son loved us so much that he would stretch out his arms and die for us. That is the message of salvation. And those who would receive that and those who would put their faith and trust, lean completely into it for their salvation would be saved. It's so much like a drowning man. A drowning man must put his full weight into the person who rescues them. He must come to the realization, I can't save myself. One of the things I learned early on in, in lifeguarding was how to rescue somebody if you have nothing to rescue them with except your body. And they always told us that as you swim with your head up towards the person, keep your eyes on them, talk to them, and make certain that they understand that they must give up and allow you to rescue them. They must understand that they cannot fight you because if they fight you, you both may go down. And sometimes they said, you just have to wait until they finally go under, then get them. Well, folks, I tell you what, that is with salvation. We have got to see people get to the point where they are totally exhausted of their own works, own ability, own understanding, until they finally surrender themselves and say, I can't. He must. And that was the message that Peter shared with them. It is an exclusive message. It is an only one-way message. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must 
be saved. Jesus said, again, I am the way, the truth, and the life. What? No man comes unto the Father but by me. Folks, we, we cannot be, there are more than one way to heaven. And yet, that is what our culture wants us to be preaching. That's what they want to say, the archbishop there in New York City. It's an exclusive message, and we have an inclusive message, that there's multiple ways to go to heaven. Folks, we must remain firm on that truth and that doctrine. Amen? I don't know of any other way, and there is only one way, and that's through Jesus Christ alone. Folks, we've got friends, we've got people who you know, and they may go to church, but these people, these Jews, were going to church, to the synagogues. They were going to the temple, and yet they were no more saved than the person who was outside of the temple. Just because we put on a religion, although we put on a denomination, although we go to church and have a Bible, that does not necessarily mean a person is saved. How about those that you know? Just because they go to church, do you know that they will go to heaven one day because their faith and trust is in Christ and Him alone? Let us share that message. The response or the deliberation, take a look at verses 13 through 17, the deliberation, and it's kind of comical. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. Uh, two words that jump out at me, or several, but boldness, that's a change, isn't it? That's a change from what Peter was and John to the, what they were today. So there had been a change. And they perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men. First of all, the word uneducated, that means uh, it, it uses the word grapho or graphite, which means writing. And uh, in the Greek, it does. And, and what it means is that they were basically, they, di they didn't have formal writing or reading. Basically, they were illiterate. That's what they saw. They didn't have any formal education, so they thought, eh, they're kind of illiterate. The word untrained is uh, more of an unkind word, if you want to put it that way. It is idiotes. Idiotes. Idiot. Idiot. That's where we get our word idiot. They were untrained men, but they marveled. Why? Because they knew that they had been with Jesus, because Jesus' teaching is what they were preaching. They took the words of Christ and they delivered them to their people. You know, I, I think sometimes people, uh, I don't know, this is freebie, okay? Kind of gets underneath my skin sometimes. People will say, you don't need to go and get an education to be a preacher. I'm thinking, where do you get that from? Well, because no, the Bible doesn't say that. I said, the disciples were with the best professor they could ever have asked for. For three and a half years, they walked 24 hours a day with who? Jesus. And they heard his teaching. They were instructed by Jesus. And I don't know about you, but 24 hours a day for three and a half years comes out to a whole lot of schooling, doesn't it? And so let us beware of people who just kind of use that and even uh, with it. But Lord, save us. You don't need to go off to a seminary to be a Christian. You don't need to go off to seminary to know what Christ says. You come to the church, amen? And the church helps teach and train and equip and encourage you and give you things that help you in your learning and your walk with the Lord. I don't know how many times I've heard people say uh, thanks to Pastor BJ from a couple years ago when he challenged us to read through the Bible and how it makes a difference. And just by that encouragement that gets you to spend time with who? Jesus. And what a beautiful thing it is. But the deliberation, the verdict, they really could not believe. In verse 14, and seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, that was a problem, 
they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For indeed that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak to no man in this name. Again, what was the focus? We've got to stop the preaching and teaching about Jesus. Problem. The Sadducees didn't even believe in miracles. The Sadducees didn't believe in the supernatural. They believed only in what you could see, feel, and experience. The Sadducees were those that said, you know what, we're going we're gonna to talk about miracles, but we're going to have an answer for them. Have any of you watched the History Channel and seen where they talk about Jesus walking on the water and how that probably happened? I can't, I, I, I was unbelievable. The few times I've ever had cable, I had cable and it was talking about Jesus coming on the iceberg. That's how he probably did. There was an ice thing floating there and he actually must have been on that. Of course, then they talked about the disciples hallucinating and all these things. But again, we are always trying to deny Jesus Christ dying and rising from the dead. They try to explain that you, he swooned his death. He, he passed out, and then he revived when he was in the tomb. Good luck getting out of the tomb after you revive. There's all kinds of problems with that. But they try to give reasons as why these miracles didn't happen. But these Sadducees were stuck. For the man was standing right there, and everybody else knew who this man was. They all knew that this man was 40 years lame. There was no way that they could unravel that miracle and turn it into something that it was not. Does it sound familiar with the article I read at the beginning? We're trying to cast aspersions and trying to remove those who would do things in Jesus' name. They want Samaritan's Purse to drop all of that and just be a social agency. They want the Samaritan's Purse to do things, to be there, but don't do it in Jesus' name, for God forbid people might actually follow that Jesus, which is a problem for our society and culture because Jesus stands between our culture and God himself. Let's take a look at the response as they are threatened. And by threatening, that means they were pressured to keep their mouths shut. Verse 18, so they called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. Now think about this, folks. Do you think their threatening was, guys, just, don't tell anybody more, okay? Just, just stop it. You think that's what they said? Oh, buddy. It was a menacing. That's another word for it. And I think it means this, that they probably threatened them that if you continue this, your family is at risk. You are at risk. Your life is at risk. Your livelihood is at risk. If you continue doing this, we will bring the full weight of all the power that we have, and eventually we will stomp you out. Do you understand us? We are told in our society and culture today that we better keep our mouths shut at work. We better keep our kids from talking too much about Jesus at school. Teachers need to keep their mouths shut and not have a Bible on their desk or teach these things. We've got a, a push. And, and what they've done is they've threatened us this way. If you do it, you can lose your job. We will shut you down. How many of us have fallen for that? That's a tough one, isn't it? Because it has threatened you at the very core 
of everything that you have kind of worked for in our life? Can we be creative and still share Jesus in the workplace? Yes. But can we keep our mouth shut? Verse 19, but Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them because of the people, since they all glorified God for what had been done. For the man who was over 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. Again, did God protect them in this moment? God doesn't, we will see in the chapters ahead, the threatenings became more physical. In fact, we only go one more chapter and we will see where it goes. But as a church and as a people, we have been faced with this very thing. Now, this verse can easily be taken out of context and used in a way that probably is not best. And that is this. Sometimes we can take verse number 20, verses 19 and 20, and we could apply them to anything that we want. We could say, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. In other words, I'm going to say what I want to say and do what I want to do no matter what. Is that really what that verse is teaching? That we can just ignore government, we can ignore those who are over us? No. This is what I want to share with you in this one bit a moment. Number one, aren't you glad for a nation that has given us the freedoms that we have? Yes? Isn't it great to be an American? Number two is this. Aren't you glad that we have been given a process, a due process, in which we can share our grievances and make our statements known? Amen? May we not be like what we have been seeing over the past month, protesting violently and doing things recklessly and doing things that are just plain evil. May we not be a part of that type of response in America. Because we have a message of Jesus Christ that must is greater than any other message. And I hate bringing up politics. It seems like week after week after week. But folks, we are in the midst of some very perilous times. And we can't ignore it. And we have a voice. And we can share it. But let us not lower ourselves and be breaking the principles of God's word. Peter himself well, even Jesus himself, he said, give unto Caesars what is Caesars, give unto God what is God's. I don't know about you, but do you like to pay taxes? I don't. Ugh. Can we take that out of scripture? <laughs> Can we remove that, please? But Christ always taught this submission to our government, but yet there is a time when we have to choose between God and our government. But Peter said this in 1 Peter 2, verses 13 through 17. He said this, Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to governors, ugh, as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Honor all people and should we not do that honor all it says further love the brotherhood fear god honor the king and that was written to a group of people that were living under a government that makes our government look really good and yet here is peter saying may we remember there is a time and when they say you cannot do things in Jesus' name or you must violate Scripture in order to be safe, we must say what? No. I will stand where God stands, and I will speak what God speaks. I will do what God says I must do. And we must be prepared for that. And the disciples, they were ready for the consequences. Let me take a look at... We're not going to spend much time on this, but what did they do? 
verse 23. And being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all the chief priests and elders had said to them. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. We're going to take a look at these four things I'm going to share with you in about five minutes. First thing is, if we are going to encounter, and when we encounter threats, we encounter that resistance, what must be about us? Number one is filled with the Spirit. Clear back in verse 8, we're going to take a look at that next week. How are we filled with the Spirit? May we be filled with the Spirit of God and not filled with whose Spirit? My Spirit. My desires. It's got to be an emptying of self, and it must be a filling with, okay, God, I need to be in controlled or controlled by you, not my emotion, not my feeling, not my opinions, but I must be controlled by you. And Peter, being so, spoke. A second response we see there in verses 19 and 20, which we looked at there, they stood with God, not man. We got to be ready to stand with God and not man. If it comes between the two, are we ready to do so? A third thing that they did is that they fellowshiped with the church. They fellowshiped with the church. They were came back, and the value of the church is huge here. When difficult times came, where did they end up going? Back to the church. And that's not a physical building, folks. It's the people of God. And a fourth thing that they did is that they prayed with the church. And we're going to take a look at that prayer next week. You can read up on it. You can do that. And I'll tell you what, it is not a prayer that so often uh, we are typical in praying. But along with it, these four things are things that they did in order to withstand the threats and the difficulties of their time. I want to refer back to that article just for a moment and what Mr. Pike said, which is exactly what Franklin Graham says. And in fact, I heard just this week, anytime he's interviewed, what does he do? Anytime you've ever heard Franklin Graham be interviewed, he always puts in the gospel. Do you think of a time that anytime he's ever been interviewed that he doesn't proclaim the name of Jesus Christ? Think about it. And Mr. Pike said these words, we work here with people who all share a common sense of purpose. We are all here because Jesus died for us and for our sins. So we came here to lay down a small part of our lives to help others. How could we not? Give sacrificial love. Giving sacrificial love is very important to us. In the name of Jesus Christ. Folks, if we are going to be threatened, may it be first and foremost for preaching the gospel and sharing that Jesus Christ is the only way to salvation. Because when we stand before the Lord, he's going to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Because of why? Because we proclaimed whose name? His name. Let's pray. Our gracious God and Father, we come before you this morning, and I thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for the example of Peter and John. We thank you for how you gave them a boldness and a perseverance in the midst of threats, because they proclaimed your name. They spoke your word and were truthful. Lord, may that be what we promote. May it not be our opinions, but it may be your word, and may we say it's because of Jesus' name. May we do the things we do, say the things we do, because you first said them. And may we constantly be directing people back to you, the person of Jesus Christ. That our opinions be built out of your truth. May they not be, again, our opinions, but yours. 
Lord, I pray for those that find themselves in, in difficult situations as they share you with those around them. Lord, I pray that you would give them doors of opportunity to speak you into the situations, whether at work or uh, just around a fire or around uh, a, a cookout, even this summer, that we would proclaim your name. Lord, I pray for the protection of this church for each of us. That as we proclaim your truth in this culture and this world around us, that you would put a hedge of protection about us, but Lord, also that you would give us boldness to persevere, to not fall back when it would be easier to do so. when others may pressure us to open up the message and include others who are of, who speak forth sin as though it's okay, that we not fall back and change the message so that we might have it easier. Lord, may we have boldness. May we not cower if threats come our way. But Lord, may we do so out of a spirit-filled life that's controlled by you and not ourselves. We ask this in your son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Let's all stand together as we close off our time this morning. We're going to be looking at hymn number 470.